Hi, this is Dr. Lisa Naj, and we're doing a short video on the use of midadrine for dysautonomia, or POTS. So POTS is a type of dysautonomia. It's called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and it means when you stand up that the heart goes quickly. There are other kinds of dysautonomia, which cause you to have a slow heartbeat, or to faint, or to uh, have a fast heartbeat and then a slow heartbeat, but the main one we see in environmental patients is POTS. So when you stand up, you put a pulse ox on the patient, and you wait a few minutes to see what happens with the heart rate. A normal heart rate is 72, and if the person stands up immediately, the heart rate's gonna go up a little bit and then equilibrate in about 60 seconds. So you stand up, the blood's pooling in your legs, the veins constrict, and send the blood back up again. And so you become normal and the heart rate should return to about the same as what you have when you're laying down, about 72. It is considered normal to have 10 beats higher when you're standing than when you're laying down. So you could be 72 lying down and 82 standing up and that's considered okay. Anything faster than that means the, the heart is struggling because it's empty and there's not enough blood in it. So when it's squeezing, it's not pumping enough blood to the head and there's a message that says, go faster. And then the blood pressure can increase under the strain and it goes faster and the blood pressure goes up. So if I'm watching somebody's pulse ox and I get the maximum heart rate, this is for like a doctor to know what to do as well as a patient, they say, okay, the peak heart rate is 98. I've been waiting a few minutes. It's as fast as it's gonna go. And then I hit the blood pressure cuff. I have the arm at the level of the heart and the person shouldn't be talking because then they're forcing the blood out of the heart. So I have the patient not talk and do the vital signs. And if I don't like what I get, I repeat it until it seems to be reproducible. And I get the same blood pressure roughly a couple times in a row. Sometimes you'll do it the first time and then you'll do it again in three minutes and the blood pressure will climb. And this is hypertension due to postural tachycardia and dysautonomia and it's not well described um, in the literature. There's some evidence for it, you know, in published articles, but the average doctor doesn't know. It could be a cause of high blood pressure. So you'll walk in, you'll have high blood pressure, you'll sit at the doctor's office, it'll still be a little high, they'll record it and they'll give you drugs that are inappropriate because you've got dysautonomia. They'll give you drugs to urinate and lose volume, like hydrochlorothiazide, or they could give you other drugs to slow the heart, and then you just can't cope at all because the heart's beta blocked and you can't pump fast enough and then you wanna, you feel fatigued and like you're gonna faint. So this blood pressure is pretty good and pretty consistent of 117 over 70, but the heart rate is 96. And you've been standing for a while, the first blood pressure we got was 93 over 70. So it has gotten higher, uh, 117 over 70, but it's not bad. So if somebody had higher blood pressure, that would be like a reason that we would tell the other doctor that the blood pressure is going up. So then we would lie it down and we'll compare and see if the heart rate is in the 70s or the 60s. And if it's 20 beats higher when you're at the doctor's office, then I send you for a tilt table. I use Beth Israel Hospital in Boston and they don't do any medication injection. They just put you on a table, tilt your head up and let the blood run down the legs and they may measure your blood pressure and heart rate every uh, minute. And if the person can't handle it because they feel like they're gonna faint, they say, okay, I'm done. And then they just put you right and then you feel good again. Would you like to sit down while we're talking or is it hard to, to stand? No, no problem. Okay, good. So the main thing in dysautonomia is that you can't get well quickly from sauna and IV vitamins and get rid of your dysautonomia in two seconds flat. So what I feel is important is that to proceed with the detoxification process and be able to handle five minute sauna, then a 10 minute sauna, you need to get these, this issue with the dysautonomia treated. Otherwise, you go in the sauna and your veins and, and vessels dilate and then your, your blood is nowhere near being in the heart. It's all in the periphery. It's in the skin and you feel faint and you could get out of the sauna and you could collapse. So we don't want that. We want to stabilize somebody before we start sauna. And the, the, the drug treatments or stabilization techniques are midadrine, fluoronaph, stockings, salt, and you can use licorice if somebody doesn't tolerate the fluoronaph. It's called glyceriza. And sometimes there are other medications used to treat dysautonomia. We won't go into all of those. Even high-dose Prozac helps dysautonomia. 
Um, there are uh, six things that make dysautonomia worse. So let's list them right here. The first one is standing a long time. So if you have bad dysautonomia, you wouldn't be able to stand here very long. The next thing is eating a big meal, because all the blood pools and goes to the gut. And then you can feel tired or feel chilly after eating. All right, so you need a sweater, that kind of thing. Um, the other things are exercise. So if you were just exercising and walking around the property, your blood goes to your muscles and it makes the dysautonomia worse because there's less blood centrally located. The other things that um, some people don't know about are a lowering of the barometric pressure. So if there's a storm front coming in, a lot of times you won't be able to stand up or get out of bed because you feel more dysautonomic. And this is why I think cows lay down. And I think I may be the only person who ever described this. Cows lay down before a storm, yeah. before the rain. Yes, and it's because they're probably feeling tired and they need to lie down. Because if the atmospheric pressure goes down, the pressure from the veins can increase. If the pressure of the atmosphere is higher, it's pushing your veins closed. When, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of people don't feel good the day it's raining or the day right before it rains. The mold count also goes up when it's raining or after it's rained. So that's another issue that can also make dysautonomia worse. The other things are going into a store and there's high VOCs in the air. So you would need a wheelchair when you're in Target or Home Depot or some store, but when you're outside you feel better because you can stand up and the autonomic nervous system responds negatively to chemicals in the air. Now this has been described by David Christiani at Harvard. So it's in the literature that outdoor air pollution changes the autonomic nervous system. And there are subsequent articles uh, confirming this. But the problem is we need NIEHS and NIH to do studies on indoor air. Because indoor air is supposed to be five times worse than outdoor air, but nobody realizes it's making people unable to stand up all day. Um, the last thing I want to touch base on, if you can continue, is the use of minadrine. So you start with 2.5 milligrams, or even a half of that, 1.25. Make sure the person's not allergic to it, doesn't hate it. And then when it kicks in in about 30 minutes and it peaks at 90 minutes and it's gone at four hours, when it kicks in, you feel a tingle on your scalp. It's called goosebumps of the, of the scalp. And you may want to scratch and it feels very good. It's an itch feeling. It's not an allergy, but that's alpha agonist effect on your scalp. Then you can get a chill and you can look and see your hairs will stand on end. That's alpha agonist effect on the rest of the body. So you could be chilly because of taking Minadrine. So what I do, and for doctors who want to prescribe it, I usually do this in the office for two days. I give them 2.5 milligrams. Four hours later, five milligrams. Then I do vital signs because that's a big enough dose that the vital signs may change and improve. So I do vital signs 90 minutes after the pill, standing and lying. And this is very important because it's a little complicated, so I'll just go through what the vital should be. The goal is to get the heart rate about what it is when you're laying down. You don't want the heart rate too slow. So if you lay down and the heart rate's 40, too slow. But you know, maybe mid-50s is, is okay. So what you do is you give the patient the five milligram dose, and if they don't have a head tingle at all, it's not enough. So you know they're gonna need 7.5 in four hours or the next morning. And then four hours later, you give 10 milligrams. Children and teenagers sometimes need 15 milligrams, but adults usually 10 milligrams is the max. Now, some people like you may have very mild dysautonomia, but feel good on a tiny dose, like 2.5 milligrams, and you feel like your legs are light and you can kind of dance around and get up and go do things. You don't feel like you're just stuck in a chair and don't want to get up and go do work. So it keeps the blood up in the head and will get rid of brain fog and make maybe the chest feel better. If the person has a heaviness in the chest, it may make that go away because the heart's no longer empty. So what I do is I look for the blood pressure to go up when they're laying down. That's what Midadrine does. Supine hypertension. It's supposed to. So if you lay down and your blood pressure is 200 over 130 or whatever, something high, it's not really that big of a deal because you're gonna take Midadrine when you're upright. It's not a lying down drug. So if you're going to go to the acupuncturist or the masseuse, you're not going to want to lay down when your midadrine is peaking. So you plan ahead and say, I'm not going to take my midadrine about an hour or two before I'm going to go lay down. And so sometimes people never take it because they think they want to take a nap. They always want to take a nap. And so they forget to even stay on a schedule. I usually get people to figure out their dose in that first two days. I give them a prescription, five milligram tablets, one or one and a half or two 
PO every four hours while standing and awake, not after 6 or 7 p.m. Four hours from bedtime. You stop it so that it wears off and you can lay down and go to bed. Does all that make sense? Okay. okay. So then what I'll do is I'll, here, let me take this off. Oh, let's see what your heart rate is. So the heart rate is still 97. What I'll do is I'll add Floridef, 0.1 milligrams at night as I'm doing the Midadrine and see if you increase the volume of water and salt that's being held onto, the person may need less Midadrine. And Floronef lasts for 24 hours. So it doesn't wear off the way that the Midadrine does. So there's a combination of Floronef and Midadrine, or if the person's allergic to fluoride or, or Floronef, they can get compounded aldosterone from Key Pharmacy, and it's very expensive. If they can't take pills, they'll make a cream, very handy, because they can still get it. Or they can take licorice. As I mentioned, you can get pills of deglycerized licorice. So you want to have the person not have swollen hands and feet from, or puffiness of the hands and feet where the rings get tight from the Florinef. And the Florinef raises blood pressure. So what I do is over that first week or two, the patient has a form that says what drug they're on, what time they took it, and then what their vital signs are standing in line. And you gotta make sure you, you monitor them so that you don't give them too much Florinef. Maybe they need two pills, maybe they, they need three. But Florinef can lower sodium and be very dangerous if you don't need it and you give the wrong dose. The people I see have adrenal insufficiency, as some people have done a positive ACTH stimulation test. They have low aldosterone, and that's Florinef. The pill Florinef is the same as aldosterone, the hormone. So you may have low aldosterone, and if I give you the Florinef, that'll replace it, and then you can take maybe a very tiny dose of Midadrine, and then your heart rate will be stable in any position. But it is not good to have a heart rate of like mid-90s because it's hard to, hard to function. So I think that's all I'll say for now. Um, basically, uh, when you do a tilt table, you don't want to be taking the Florinef for about a week. You gotta get out of your system and no Midadrine for at least two days and maybe no Cortef for a day or two. So that when you go to tilt table, you need somebody to drive you so you don't fall apart because you're not taking any of your usual things and you may feel very weak and fatigued afterwards or even have it like almost an adrenal crisis if you really have a sweating episode. So somebody has to be there to make sure that you're safe to go home and then you can take all your medication right after the tilt table, drink some water, have some salt, and then go home safely. Does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. Great, thanks very much.